Good evening, change now. Wow, what a few days it's been. It's really lovely to see. Look, I'm really excited because I think this is the nicest stage. And I know, yeah, man, give it up. Give it up for that. I know we're going to be talking about oceans, but I think there's something, there's something quite synchronous about being in a garden to talk about what we're going to talk about, especially with the panelists and the guests that we've got, because actually, Oceans are a garden, in a, in a sense, so it's really fitting. Yes, lots of, lots of nodding. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the superlatives, why our oceans are Im important in terms of their size, their scale, their potential to trap carbon, their importance in terms of habitats, their importance as a, as a food source, the fact that there are so many species living in our oceans that we don't even know about. Yet, we know the challenges and we know what's happening down there. Uh, of course, the governance world, things are changing, but at the same time, we are seeing mining expand, fishing having many challenges in the way that it's managed, and how we stop putting more and more and more plastics into this most precious resource. So, for the next hour and a bit, we have Got a fantastic keynote, which I'll tell you about in a second. We're going to follow that up with a panel where we're going to dig into, or should I say, what's the equivalent of swim into, maybe? Dive into. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to dive into some of the, some of the detail around tech solutions and finance and also activism. And then we're going to close with a, a fascinating fireside uh, around uh, seagrass, which Lots of you will be familiar with, lots of you will not be. Uh, something that I, I am really interested in living in the UK where we have lost, uh, and uh, you know, Leanne's probably going to correct me, but I think it's upwards of 90% of, of the seagrass um, areas in the UK, around the UK coastline, have lost its seagrass uh, over the last 100 years, which is a pretty terrifying statistic. Anyway, to kick us off, Sea Shepherd are activists par excellence. You will all be familiar with the work that they've done, the methods that they use, the direct action that they employ to not just talk about it, but do, to get in the way of some of the most harmful and damaging practices that we somehow, over the years, have allowed to be normal. I just want to throw out a few words that they use in, in, in their campaigning. Defend, conserve, protect. I also want to steal a little phrase that's in one of their campaign videos. Get ready to launch the ribs, which is just such a fantastic kind of rallying cry because it's that moment when Lamia Esemlali and her team will go in and do what they can do to try and stop some of the most egregious acts of ocean destruction taking place. So, uh, Lamia, I'm delighted to introduce you. Uh, she's going to talk to us about how we rethink our link to the ocean in this time of climate emergency. Lamia Esamlali, director of Sea Shepherd France. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so I have been dedicated my life to the protection of the ocean for about 20 years now. Uh, I've had the privilege, I would say, I would call that a privilege, to go defend whales in Antarctica against uh, Japanese whalers. I've had confronted poachers uh, with machetes in the beaches of Mayotte. I've been defending pirate whales against what they call the Green Drop, which is the largest slaughter of marine mammals in, in Europe. Um, I've been working also on campaigns to free bluefin tuna uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. So there is a whole list of that, that uh, these kinds of campaigns that, um, in fact, illustrate the DNA of Sea Shepherd, which is about intervening. What I want to say today is, is really the opposite of a message that would be, hey, um, to be an activist, to make a difference, you have to do all these kind of things. It's... It's not the idea. If I take my uh, personal case, I was born far away from the ocean. I was born in the suburbs of Paris, in a very uh, gloomy suburb. Um, but I had 
the opportunity, the chance to go to Morocco every summer because both my parents were from Morocco and this is where I've met with the ocean. What the ocean gave me as a child is a glance, um, hope and the comprehension that life and the world was much, much more than this uh, gloomy and depressing neighborhood where I was growing up. And it's only years after that that I came to, um, into the conscience that that ocean that was wild, that was uh, curing my, um, my sadness from, from being in, in such, a, such a sad environment, that ocean was actually threatened. It was dying because our species was considering it as, as everything that it's not, everything that it shouldn't be, which means like um, food source, uh, energy source, um, um, landfill, um, everything but the essential. What's the essential? What's the ocean? And yes, we are in a garden, and I think it's a good illustration to show that, hey, even this is linked to the ocean, because this is a planet ocean, and, and we are the ocean. And I, I really like uh, a sentence from uh, Hedcott Williams. He's a British uh, poet, and he says, seen from the sky, the planet is blue. Seen from the sky, the planet is, is not the human's territory. It's the whale's territory. And... When I've met Paul Watson, who's the founder of Sea Shepherd, I've met him in Paris in 2005. And I've heard the philosophy that was behind the construction of Sea Shepherd. And this touched my heart, it touched my soul, because it felt so right. Basically, it, it can be summed up in one thing, if the ocean dies, we die. But when we think about that, we think only of biology. Yes, yes, the ocean is the number one climate regulator. Yes, it provides food to people who would die if, if they didn't have that. And by the way, it's not the majority of human population. The majority of human population is eating fish when they could like, really easily do without it. And, and that's the main problem. There is a problem with fishing that feeds people who would starve without fish. Anyway, the thing is, if the ocean dies, we die. It's also our soul dies. I mean, if we destroy the essence of life and where we come from, we, we, can't, we can't thrive and we can't find what we are all desperately looking for. What are we all looking for? Peace. We are looking for inner peace. And this is why we are destroying this planet. Because we lost ourselves and because we made ourselves an orphan species. Because by destroying the rest of the living world, we are destroying ourselves. And look at France, for example. France is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And it's the number one consumer of antidepressants. I don't know if you said that in English. Until. And when you look at wealthy countries, do you have the impression that people are happier? I mean, no. We're not, and we, we keep looking for something that we can't find in overconsumption, in the destruction of life, the destruction of this planet. And the more we're looking and the more we're lost because we're not looking in the right place. And yet, you take anyone from any place in the world, doesn't matter how much money they make, where they're from, you put them in front of the ocean, a beautiful sunset or sunrise, this is universal beauty and this is universal happiness. So when we say, if the ocean dies, we die, it's also that that counts. Now, back to the action. Why I thought that Sea Shepherd was such an important tool? It's because I can sum up the strategy in one sentence. A whale being harpooned is not a story. But people risking their life to save that whale, it becomes a story. That's what made this action so important. It's because by having people being ready to take so many risks, to, to go to the, to the edge of the world, to save whales from being harpooned, it triggers reflection. Even through, from people who don't think about it, you know? And I think that's, that's the power of that kind of actions. 
And then I, I, I believe that aside from all the television series and all the mediatization, what's important is the fact that it's inspiring. It's inspiring for people. And over all, all the conferences, all the interviews I've made, I always have the same question. Okay, but there is a problem. We are destroying the ocean, as we are destroying this planet. So what can we do? What can we do to solve the problem? And it's overwhelming when you look at it this way, right? Because I said before, overfishing, global warming, uh, acidification of the ocean, plastic pollution, noise pollution, chemical pollution. I mean, you don't even know where to start. Although I will give you a tip. Overfishing is by far the biggest threat on the ocean. So the fish in our plates. But having said that, I think all these threats are the effects, the results of one common ground, one common thing, is the way we consider the ocean, the way we think of the ocean, is the disconnection, the fact that we, we forgot. We forgot that we came from the ocean, that we are the ocean, and that we live with the ocean or we'll die with the ocean. And rebuilding that link is mandatory, and it's the priority. And all the effects aside will come if we change. This is called change now, right? <laughs> so let's change that, that way we, we look at the ocean. And we'll stop justifying everything we do, because right now we are very good at justifying everything, right? All the overexploitation of the ocean, we have some good reasons to explain that. Because if you consider it as a food source, energy source, um, yeah, you can, you can justify what we do. So, oh, I still have 10 minutes. Cool. <laughs> so, changing that connection, how, how does it work? Um, I would say that these actions that Sea Shepherd do trigger the thinking, the change of thinking, and then when you realize uh, how bad is the situation and how harmful we are with ourselves, there are two ways of uh, reacting. One is that it's very, very scary. And you're like, wow, we've gone so far, and this is like, whew, this is hopeless. This is, again, this is overwhelming. So what should we do? Some people would just turn a blind eye on that because it's just too scary. And if you don't know what to do, uh, then the only thing you have left is to run away. And Sea Shepherd is a tool that allows you not to run away. It's not necessarily for everyone. It has been for me. It has been a way of not being conscious, being aware, and not feeling fucking depressed, <laughs> you know? And, and having, I wouldn't say hope, because it, it's not even a, about hope. It's about feeling that you are actually doing something that matters, that there is a sense, that this is meaning something, what you do with your life, you know? And this is like the most important thing. I think in the end, this is what we are all looking for. This is what we think uh, happiness is. And so when people were telling me, wow, this is really hard what you do and you are sacrificing out yourself, you know, you go, uh, you spend Christmas so far away from your family, taking, uh, taking risks. And because I, we got a lot of messages like that when we were in Antarctica. And this sounded so wrong. I was like, I don't feel like sacrificing myself for one second. I feel privileged because I'm getting the opportunity to make a difference. And... Again, you don't have to go to the edge of the world to do that. So when people tell me, again, that core question, what can we do? I answer, you are the best person to know what to do. Because what are you going to be the best at? What you love doing, you know? What interests you? What uh, makes your heart vibrate, you know? What are you good at? And think how you can put that at the service of a greater cause. If you want to help the ocean, then use your best tool, which is what you know how to do, right? 
And there is, with imagination, you can do so many things. And when I look at people who get involved in Sea Shepherd, there's so many different characters, so many different profiles, so many different nationalities, so many different stories and personal paths. And they all came together because they want to make a difference and they found a proper tool that allows them to make it. And when they go back home, then they can apply that to their everyday life. You know, some people change, change their job, and they find a way to, uh, to, to put their everyday life in harmony with the way they feel. And what I really like about, um, I think the, the main power of uh, someone like Paul Watson is that because he has done things that would seem impossible, because he has set an example, he has been inspiring for many others. And now, after 20 years of uh, being involved in the movement he has created, my biggest satisfaction is when people come and tell me, hey, you have inspired me to do some things on my own. And this is like, I don't know how you call that in English, but you know, when you pass on the thing, you know, you pass it on. And when I do that, when, when people come to me and tell me that, I feel like, yeah, I fulfilled my mission. Aside from all the campaigns when you are actually saving lives, turtle lives, because you know that because you've been on that beach that night, these turtles, they went back to the ocean free instead of being um, turned into pieces, you know? This is like very, very practical. This is a very deep satisfaction. But on a larger picture, I know that the seeds the seeds that we put in people's hearts and inspire them to join the movement, whether it's Sea Shepherd or another movement, whether they create their own, this is really the biggest fulfillment. And this is very, very satisfying. And one word about France, something that I didn't have in mind when I started Sea Shepherd France, because I've launched Sea Shepherd France when I came back from my first campaign in Antarctica, when I thought, okay, so we are at the other edge of the world fighting against um, Japanese whalers, we are the only ones there, and we cannot stay the whole uh, hunting season because we don't have enough money to pay for the fuel, so we have to go back, and for two months the whales are going to be alone with the poachers, and I was like, we cannot be blocked by money, we have to raise money. So I'm going back to France, I'm setting up Sea Shepherd France, and we're going to raise awareness towards the French population. And today Sea Shepherd France is, is one of the biggest and strongest um, entity of, of Sea Shepherd. And it's the, the only one with Sea Shepherd Brazil that stood together with Paul Watson, the founder, who has been, by the way, evicted by the four directors of Sea Shepherd Global. But that's a whole other story and we don't have time for this. <laughs> but this is, this is also very interesting. So anyway, I came back to France, I set up Sea Shepherd France and I had no idea about the importance that it had. And actually I thought that we wouldn't go anywhere because I thought the way of action, the direct action, is not, is not in the French uh, culture when it comes to the environment or saving the animals, right? So I thought people are going to think we are a bunch of crazy extremists, eco-terrorists, and we're just going to remain like really small. And actually, it didn't happen that way. On the contrary, we had such a big eco in the, in the population. And at the same time, I realized how important it was because France is the second largest married territory in the world, about 11 million square meters of sea under the French jurisdiction. So just imagine the amount of responsibility we have, right? And at the same time, it struck me when we started doing the dolphin bycatch campaign, you know, all these thousands of dolphins being caught in the French coast uh, by, by fishermen. Um, because the fishing gear is not selective enough, not because they actually target them, but the result is the same, right? And I realized, because we, we thought, okay, we have to wake up people about what's happening with these dolphins in our doorstep. We cannot let that happen. That population is getting in, going extinct, and people don't even know about it. So we started to expose dead dolphins in cities, in, in the heart of cities. And I remember very well, in, in 2019, the very first exposition we made in La Rochelle, with the uh, dolphins that we found dead, like really near the, the harbor. And people were looking at the dolphin and saying, we have no dolphins here. Where did this dolphin come from? This is a fake dolphin, by the way. That blood is ketchup. I swear we got that 
kind of answers. And not one or two people, like a lot of people, a lot, in La Rochelle, like by the sea. And I was like, okay, so we are coming from really, really far. Because how can we save dolphins when, when people don't even know that we have them? And I very often quote um, Eric Tabarly, which is, who is a, a famous French navigator, because he was saying, the problem is that for the French, the ocean is that thing they have in their back when they lay down their towel on the beach. We are disconnected. And if there is one nation that needs to reconnect with the ocean, it's the second largest marine territory. It's, it's the French nation. And we have to set up an example. So, yeah, I think it begins there. And everything else will follow. So I would sum up, after everything we've done, everything we say, I would say that our main objective, my, my main mission, is to work on reconnecting people with the ocean. Because again, everything else will follow. So I would just encourage you to rethink how you think of the ocean. If when you think of fish, you think in stocks, you think in, in tons, you think it's vegetable. Because when you say you're a vegetarian, they offer you a salmon sandwich, you know? <laughs> because, hey, but this says something, you know? Words do say something. So just, yeah, start there. Rethink that. And you will see that many, many things that seem normal to you will appear like really shocking because you are getting closer to the truth, which is that we are the ocean and that... Um, we are dependent on the ocean. And again, it's not only our bodies that will die if the ocean dies, but our souls. And I think it's as important, if not even more important. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Lermia. I don't need that. I have this funny thing taped to my... Uh, thank you so much for setting the scene. Um, and I, I just can't really imagine what it's like being in Antarctica, being willing to throw myself in the way of a very large ship with a very sharp pointy thing and lots of big mammals in the sea. So, um, yeah, we, we salute the work that you do. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Merci. Okay, so, yeah, lots of... Uh, Lots of food for thought there um, about how we change the way we look at the ocean. We're going to talk about that in, in more detail, uh, particularly around how we think about value chains and financing and the governance that surrounds it. So it is my pleasure to invite up here to the, the stage, if we can call it that, um, uh, our brilliant panelists, Aaron Stevenson and Ross Brooks. And is Amber here? Do we have Amber? We don't. Well, if Amber shows up, you have a seat ready for you, Amber Nuttall. Uh, but in the meantime, Ross and Aaron, and you'll see, in fact, should, do I need to bring, is that yours as well? Pretty good. Okay. Safety, safety right. Okay. We've got props, team. We've got stuff. We've got kit. How would you like it? Um, why don't you put it, I'll tell you what, why don't you put it there? Because otherwise it's going to be behind. I'll put that there. And uh, Ross, why don't you sit there? And I will sit here. Um, so you may be wondering what all this stuff is. Do not despair because we're going we're gonna to tell you all about it. Uh, but first off, Aaron Stevenson uh, is, a, is a technologist and an a entrepreneur and, uh, and uh, co-founded and runs Asherid, which is a, a, an ocean tech company making all kinds of interesting stuff that is uh, going to reduce human impact on, on ocean life. And Ross Brooks, who's next to me, is the general partner at Catapult Ocean. Who, and, and, and Ross is involved in trying to figure out how do we get more resource, more support, more money to people that are innovating, uh, people that are creating the solutions that are going to mean we can stop destroying our ocean. Right, Aaron, we've got to start with you. What have we got here? 
So what we have here is um, our solution uh, to marine animal entanglements. So uh, France has the second largest uh, Make sure you coastal, keep the mic right up. coastal yeah. waters. Um, I'm from Atlantic Canada. Canada has the largest uh, coastal. So um, it's important that we're, we are preserving and, and working ethically on, uh, on those. And so what we've done uh, is come up with this solution uh, as a means of protecting marine animals, um, particularly uh, North Atlantic right whale, which is an endangered species, um, from entanglements in, uh, in lobster, uh, in the ropes that are um, in the water uh, for the lobster and crab fisheries and, and other uh, fixed gear fisheries as well. So what, so what typically would happen, there'll be a pot on the bottom, a buoy on the top, uh, gear in between, and it would damage the animals. That's right, yeah, and it creates this obstacle course. I mean, you've got millions of these ropes out there yep. um, for whales trying to navigate through that. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, well, it's, a, it's a death trap. <laughs> it's a death trap, so, uh, absolutely. So what is this, how does that, you know, this is one of many solutions one of, that, yeah. With, yeah, so what does this do? So what this does is it, uh, we take the, the ropes in the, and the buoy that would normally be through the water column, contain it down on the ocean floor next to the, uh, the traps, uh, and tie off onto it so that we uh, don't have any more impediments to uh, marine life. They can swim freely. Um, and we also reduce uh, a lot of the issues that often lead to um, lost and abandoned or, or uh, derelict fishing gear mm -hmm. um, as well, such as storm damage, propeller cutting, things like that. Yep. Um, and being able to track where all the gear is, know what pieces are connected together, also allows us to, to really change the game in the way of, of how we go about fishing and using it as a resource that uh, can, you know, can be better managed, um, better understood, uh, but also really um, respects the, the ocean and, and the other uh, marine uh, species that are, that are part of it. And, and at the heart of this is it should make financial, se financial sense for, for the fishers. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, we don't... You know, if we're asking fishermen to, to change the way that they're going to fish, change, um, you know, their behaviors to a more sustainable approach, we, we don't want to then penalize them for, for doing that. So it has to be a, a solution that's going to, um, going to, at the very least, uh, not cost them a lot, but second or benefit, even better would be to take that next step where they actually are able to get paid in order to be able to fish in a more sustainable way. Uh, manner. So Ross, and I know, I know you guys actually have a, you, you, you guys know each other, let's put it like that, but when you see innovations like this, what do you think? Uh, I think it's a no-brainer. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, the, the trick, trick with gear is to make it usable uh, and make it, make it, for it to make it economic sense. It needs to be able to be kicked around the deck and, and last a long time in, in, in the water and out of the water. Uh, and I think that's one of the tricks in, in terms of adop adoption, especially in uh, potentially um, high, ha high hardware industrial segments. Uh, we need to have durable technologies and it needs to make economic sense very simply uh, to get the adoption. Um, so yeah, no, we've, we've known Aaron for quite some time uh, and uh, we, have, uh, we have actually co-investors uh, both in our fund, also in, in Aaron's company. So yeah, we love the work that they're doing. So obviously other solutions are available. Um, uh, but what, what I want to know a bit more about and what I think you can help us with is understanding the, finance, the financial models that sit behind the ability for all of us to start to invest in solutions like this. What's happening out there? Okay, that's a big, big question. Okay, so maybe, maybe some background on Catapult Ocean, for, first of all. Um, we're, we're an investment company based in Oslo, Norway. Uh, we're investing from early stage to, I guess, the early growth stage in private companies uh, who are creating a positive impact uh, on the ocean and ocean ecosystems. Um, we slice and dice the ocean into four key segments. So that's marine transportation, uh, blue energy, uh, food and water. So clean water is also integrated into our strategy um, and, uh, uh, and circular resources. I'm not sure I mentioned that one, but uh, yeah, those are the, those are the four. Um, uh, we have an accelerator program. So we really help to, um, uh, yeah, help, help a company to understand its impact, communicating impact. We help a company to plan their fundraising strategy forward for the next uh, several, several years. And we try to connect companies with industry to, to the best of our extent. 
So the ocean industries, they're typically very top-heavy. You have kind of oligopolies, uh, very high capex with shipping companies, ship owners, large aquaculture players, which are typically very hard for, uh, for, for startups to, to sell to um, and to, to, um, uh, or, or to, to integrate with it anyway, to be, to be quite honest. So we are trying to be that strategic bridge, mm. uh, somewhat insulated from the industry uh, and understand the industrial problem, problems and also kind of teaching as well industrials and how to engage with startups. Um, and, and, yeah. and, and are you, are you seeing, uh, are you seeing a, a step change in the amount of finance that is potentially available to get to innovators? So the, the ocean space is very, it's an interesting one, right? So 70% um, of, the, of the surface of the Earth, 99.9% uh, .9 of the livable, livable space on the planet is in this three-dimensional space in that 70%. Uh, and we focus all of our capital prim primarily on this two-dimensional you know, strip of, of land uh, on that surface. Um, the st statistics now in terms of ocean venture funding, um, ocean venture funding has increased 10x over the last 10 years. So we're on a massive positive trajectory in terms yep, of more yep. capital availability into this space. But it's still only 0.2% of total venture capital funding globally in 2023. That was the second best ever year for ocean venture financing, and it was the worst ever year for global venture financing last, last year. So, so we're at a tiny proportion. We need a huge industrial, industrial transition now in you know, very powerful carbon-intensive segments, um, pa industrial pathways to blue decarbonization can get us to 21% of the mitigation that we need for the, pa for the Paris goal to be met by 2050. Uh, so 21% mitigation potential for the blue industrial pathways, 0.2%. So to answer your question, a uh, very steep increase now in terms of uh, capital coming in and people's awareness of, of ocean, mm -hmm. um, but still very early. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need, we need way more engagement, I think, is the, is the, is the, is the word. So I, I, I want to talk in a moment a little bit about the kind of governance situation. Uh, um, obviously, new um, agreements are in place. But, we, but before we get there, and, and also the role of data, are you seeing this on the ground? I mean, you, when you speak to your buddies who are fellow technologists trying to come up with new ideas, are people frustrated at the, the, the inability to get finance and support? Or is... Do you feel like the, the spigot has been turned on? Um, the, the spigot might be turned, but it's very slow drip. Right. Um, it's probably the best way to say that. It's, uh, it, it is better than it was five years ago, yep. um, but it is still um, extremely difficult uh, to, to raise investment. Uh, you know, and and the, the, the values that, uh, or the amounts that we're looking to raise are minuscule in comparison to um, so many other sectors with, you know, uh, fintech or, uh, um, uh, well, I mean, just, just about every other uh, technology sector. Um, you know, it's nothing to go and raise 20, 30 million on, uh, on a product, but to actually do something like this where you've got so many moving parts with regulatory aspects of it and yeah. uh, marine and, and just, it's, it's a far more complex um, project to understand, and therefore you need a far more educated uh, um, investment community yep. to understand what's going into it. And that that's not there's not a lot um, a lot that have really stepped forward and said I'm going to take that uh, take on that challenge. Got it. Um, another on the on the, I was going to say on the ground question, but that's totally the wrong word to use in this context, isn't it? Another in the sea question. We've got, a, we've got a high seas treaty. What does that mean in practice to you? Not <laughs> yeah. be, you can be as honest as you want. Circle of friends. <laughs> Circle of truth. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. One of the things that, that our technology does, you know, it's not just physically getting the, uh, the, the lines and the buoys out of the way, physically protecting the whales, physically protecting the marine environments. Um, we're also providing, uh, capturing data and doing it in a way that makes it autonomous, adds validity to it as well. So 
you know, so that we can really open up the transparency and traceability uh, yeah. within the within the supply chain of, of, uh, of the commercial fisheries, and that's uh, to date has been a, a huge challenge um, with the uh, IUU and, and everything else that's going on uh, in the fisheries. Um, so to be able to have that, you know, I think that that's really going to be one of the biggest drivers that's going to carry the fisheries forward is. You know, integrating or, or combining the financial transaction with a product transaction with a data transaction to ensure that the um, you know what you're getting is caught ethically, um, you know, sustainably and 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 is properly documented. Uh, and Ross, well, I, I feel we're moving on to the data path here, but but before we get that, in fact, maybe you can combine this. Maybe it's both things are relevant. Governance-wise, um, BBNJ has, has it made any difference to your work? It was it was certainly exciting in the community <laughs> when it was ratified uh, last year. But uh, for those who don't know, the BBNJ treaty is biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. It was, a, it was a UN treaty to essentially say that we need to not damage the ocean in the high seas, and the high seas is important because there is no regulatory governance framework to. To, to manage that resource. It's really a common asset uh, with no protection whatsoever. Uh, um, you have, for example, exclusive on economic zones, which can go a certain distance offshore, which are under sovereign or, or national jurisdiction. Everything outside those, you know, it's pirate land. Um, so um, uh, the, the BBNJ, uh, fantastic, exciting. Um, there is still no way to enforce and if you're, if you're a small island community or if you're a coastal community in, for example, Africa, mm. and you're, you're trying to you know, patrol and uh, enforce uh, in, in your near shore or your, the high seas around your, around your country, there is, um, there is no way to actually do it. So, so you, have a, you have a regulation, uh, you have no teeth, um, and I think that's really what we need in order to get, to get a change. Um, it's, it's an open gate for rogue yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no enforcement, and data can go some way to, um, I guess, provide uh, insight into the damage which has been done, and then to build a case towards enforcement. Uh, the, there are some exciting companies like Unseen Labs, which Swen invested in. It was announced, uh, I think, a couple two weeks ago. Um, uh, you know, sat satellite, satellite, 75 million euro round, so great for the ocean, ocean industries and the ocean world. Um, yeah, using satellite data to look at um, uh, unreported illegal fishing vessels and other damaging activities to actually you know, provide a tool to engage them and, and create a, a disincentive. But again, who is but who's, who's going who's to enforce it, right? Yeah, if you exactly. find, you know, hey, there's some bad guys. Yeah, I mean, I mean okay, have, they're still have, there. And then you have sea, you have Sea Shepherd, you know, doing amazing work. But sea, sea, sea Shepherd really shouldn't need to exist. You know, it's it's a it's a terrible terrible um, uh, state of affairs, really. Uh, this has to be yeah. taken more seriously. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish we had Amber with us because we could talk a little bit can about we, activism. Can we, can we get it back? Yeah, <laughs> Amber, go back, go back. Well, it, it, to that point, yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a role for um, for activism and enforcement within um, the, the financial transactions, within the markets itself. Uh, if you yep. cannot sell a product unless you have the data that validates that product, you know, eventually it's, it's going to weed out uh, a lot of that and, and, and the market itself um, should be uh, the, the the enforcement tool or mechanism, I guess, for uh, for combating that. And d data is clearly crucial to the work that you absolutely. do, Ross. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I think um, data. We we haven't got so many kind of governance tech companies in our portfolio, um, and one of the reasons being we don't have the we don't have the. Um, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to build a new market in, with very long sales cycles without having the information around whatever you're protecting. Right. So, so Aaron's to totally right. If you're able to kind of label a catch and, uh, and regulate anything which isn't, re isn't labeled, then, and that has to go into the black market, then you can change consumer behavior and you have a pricing element which will, which will fix some piece of this. But data is surely crucial, crucial for any kind of governance tech. Um, the other piece on, uh, on data, so we're, um, we made our first kind of nat pure natural capital investment uh, last year in, into a company called Coral Vita. They are a coral restoration company, and it's quite an unusual company for a venture, venture investor to invest in. 
Right. Um, you know, this is... Well, the, because what's the payback? What's the payback? Exactly. So you need to find kind of ta tangible revenue streams from an intangible value creator. Right. Uh, and, and to say that coral reefs are intangible value is also baffling because they, they represent 20, the spawning area for 25% of life in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, and they're being destroyed at a rate of knots, which is, which, is, which is terrifying. So if we don't do something about coral reefs, then we're all in a very a bit of a pickle, put it, put, put it that so way. So how do you create value? So, like, like, you know, spreadsheetable value. Spreadsheetable value, yeah. Then you need to, so um, it's a bit of a pyramid. So, for example, with coral, coral, coral vita, um, so the tourism sector, that, there's money there, right? And people yeah. like to dive on corals. So it's a bit cynical, but it's true. Yeah, so yeah. People will go they'll, and they'll, they'll, pay, a, they'll pay a lot of money. They'll pay, for, pay a, lot of, a lot of money, exactly. Um, and then, yeah, maybe next on that kind of pyramid is uh, infrastructure, so coastal defense and infrastructure that's kind of ins insurable and, 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 fi uh, and financeable in some way. Uh, and finally, we're, we're kind of banking really on the biodiversity credit market coming to the fore in the next five, ten years. Um, if that market doesn't materialize in the same way as carbon or plastic, then um, uh, yeah, uh, well, we're confident that it will, put, put it that way. So you start with these kind of tangible revenue streams that the, least, the less financially tangible will become tangible. That's at least uh, the way we're, we're, we're modeling things out. Um, and if we don't invest in this kind of, kind of backup technology, because coral, coral is, 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 is faced with systemic threats, um, uh, yeah, we need to be kind of covering a lot of different bases to make sure we don't lose this, uh, these natural capital assets. You, you mentioned corals. Um, is that something that you've, uh, sorry, you've mentioned plastics. Um, Aaron, is that something that you've been thinking about in your work, how to stop plastic going in, take it out? It, absolutely. Um, uh, the, actually, the very first panel that I spoke on was on a plastics panel in the ocean uh, because you know, microplastics, uh, it's, it's just into everything and, and, and is, um, you know, it's, there is so much of it that comes directly from the commercial fisheries. Yeah. Uh, that's added into the oceans each year, uh, you know, upwards of 25 million traps lost annually that continue uh, to, to um, catch, but also to pollute, um, the, uh, pollute the oceans. Uh, and, and a lot of these have an element of plastic, um, and, and most of them is a, a blend of different plastics as well, uh, which makes it even, even more challenging to, um, to be able to, to, to work with, because it's, you know, it's one thing to haul the, get the rope out, but then what, how do you break it down into the different components? There's complexities there, um, but it's it, it's it's just so um, prevalent across mm. the board. Um, and we, you know, we see some of these kind of very sci-fi looking innovative solutions of uh, uh, you know sinks in the middle of the ocean that strain. And what's exciting you in that space? What what do you see? You think, oh my gosh, I wish I'd I wish I'd invented that. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, our approach, first off, is, is um, you know, it's a prevention, right? Um, yeah. So that saying don't let goes it get that, there in the first you know, place. Sometimes the best way to get out of a hole is to stop digging. Um, it's that kind of idea. Um, so looking at it, you know, can we, what other materials can we use beyond plastics uh, to accomplish that job? And, and so we so look at that. Um, then it's, you know, beyond that, then you start looking at, well, what are the, you know, you start looking at is, is systems thinking. Um, and, and so what are the other pieces that, um, that this would interact with or engage with? And I think Coral Vita, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they also have a play with uh, reinsurers uh, as a pr protective, um, because it provides protection around uh, resorts and stuff that would be otherwise exposed to um, higher, higher risks, right? So, being able to look at reinsurers, look at these other markets, and and look at, um, you know, what where is the pollution coming from? Mm -hmm. What can we do to prevent it? How do you remedy it? But then it's, you know, that the again it comes back. I think uh, the finance has a big play in it. You know, if the insurance uh, is premiums and stuff is going to be going up because of the, the risk that is posed or mm -hmm. uh, because they're not using um, you know, readily recyclable materials, things like that, that's going to de-incentivize um, some of those behaviors. Yeah, and insurance is 
presumably a very significant factor if you're in that industry. Look, I just want to kind of walk in the time that we've got left. I just want to walk us back out to the governance space. Um, Ross, oh, both of you, what, what do you want to see uh, change to unlock uh, finance and to uh, start to prevent uh, at, the, at the sharp end more damaging um, practices from taking place? Ross, let's start with you. Um, I can do a, a, a brief insurance point first, but uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so for insurance, ins insurance market is, a, you know, there's a lot of, again, l large players who aren't really, there's no benefit for them in terms of their business model in pricing risk accurately, because if they actually did price risk accurately, nothing would be insurable. You wouldn't insure, oil, no, insure an oil rig, for, for, for example. So I think there's a case for like increased competition in the insurance market so that you the long-term pricing of risk is actually incentivized, and then we can fix maybe some of the capital market problems that we have today. In terms of the, the governance piece, piece specifically, um, well, I'm, I'm quite interested in how we can um, maybe start with marine protected areas. We have these protected areas, they're mostly paper parks because, okay, again, you can't really enforce uh, protection. And, and, um, and you're still allowed, I mean, still you, can still, you can still dredge. You can still dredge. I mean, what, yeah, well, what, is, what is that? Exactly, how protected. That makes it um, <laughs> like... But, but for example, if you, ha if you could have, uh, so technology, you could have, for example, an autonomous surface vehicle, which is powered by hydrogen. Um, you could have a you know, uh, incentivized commu fishing com communities uh, with an incentive structure around the conservation and the reporting, and maybe even some level of enforcement towards an MPA, i.e. you're an artisanal fisher uh, and you see some activities happening. Uh, if you were to report that, you might be in incentivized as part of a community scheme. Um, maybe there's some Web3 application there where you have a DAO or some kind of payout uh, to these communities who are engaging in this, in, in this work, um, supplementing and lowering the cost of the surveillance. There are some really interesting models I think we can crack to you know, mobilize the people who know the ocean the best, which are these artisanal communities typically, um, to, uh, to, to conserve but also to be paid for it. Uh, and I think these, just starting there, you know, there's, there's some quite simple models that exist that we can Which apply. may also take out some of the conflict because, you know, fishing communities are not often very, you know, resources are tight. People are not very well off all the, uh, a lot of the time. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. you, you. That you don't want to pit people against each other, which is sometimes what happens. Yeah. Aaron, you've almost got the last word. It depends how you do with your two minutes. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to pick up on that last point. With the artisanal fisheries, that sort of thing as well, if we can provide data validation that, uh, you know, a, a, a catch was, was caught, you know, it was a hand line or, or something like that, mm. have the data that supports the, the supports that, then, then you have a, a product that has a higher retail value uh, on it as well. You know, somebody, you know, something caught hand lining and then sold at a restaurant in New York. Yeah. This was caught by X on this date from this place. Yeah. People will pay for that. Exactly. Um, and then, you know, so, so there's definitely a big opportunity there. And then and I guess to, to quickly, you know, what are we looking for? What do we need uh, to advance this? Um, we've worked very closely with uh, the Canadian government, the U.S. government, over the last five years in developing this. Um, when we started out, we were tackling a product that, uh, you know, a problem that nobody would admit was there for a product that nobody wanted to buy and was illegal. So it's a challenge to raise investment, mm. um, but we also had to work hand in hand with the, with the regulatory bodies to advance it forward as the technology um, and the frameworks. So, but that's not enough, you know, mm. to then turn around to invest, uh, you know, another four or five years to, uh, to talk to France, to talk to, um, Australia or whatever, wherever these other nations are to bring them into it and open up the waters and create the opportunities for these types of technologies. Mm. Uh, We've we got to find a way to accelerate that. Mm -hmm. Well, you keep inventing, you keep financing, and, we're, and we'll, we'll continue to make progress. Um, I like it. Deal. Aaron and Ross, thank you both very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. Much appreciated. Um, uh, we have our next person, our final, our final guest. Uh, so while Aaron extracts himself with his extraordinary kit and gear, Leanne Cullen Unsworth, please join me. And um, I'll tell you what, why don't you grab that one there and our ones are over this way. So bear with us because um, 
Leanne has had such a hectic conference, you have a little bit of a sore throat, don't you? Yeah, I'm struggling oh, a little bit. Oh, the, the, that's pretty good. You, 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 can, you hear, can you hear Leanne? <laughs> you, we, we can hear cool. you. Uh, so, uh, Leanne runs, uh, is the chief executive of Project Seagrass. Um, so, I just want to do a little thing here. Everyone, stick your hand up. Everyone, stick your hand up. I can see people. Like, stick your hand up. There's lots of people on their phones, right? Okay. Um, drop your hand if you don't know what seagrass is. Okay. All right. So, so we've got, I think we've got good. Yeah. So, Leanne, what's seagrass? It's a good start point. Yeah. Um, so, seagrass is a plant. Um, it's not a seaweed. It's not a seaweed. Okay. No, it's very right. different. It's a complex plant. It's very similar to a terrestrial grass. So it's a flowering plant. So it seeds, um, flowers, produces seeds and self-seeds. Yep. Um, and where you have healthy environment, this plant can create dense, vast meadows across the seabed. And it's that complex habitat then that supports enormous biodiversity. Yep. Um, invertebrate and fish and packs down carbon and can keep it packed under there it cycles nutrients um, it provides livelihoods lots of different reasons it's, it provides a cultural connection um, it's, it's just an absolutely incredible habitat yep. and it's a global resource so um, the only continent you don't find it on currently is Antarctica yep. but it's Every other continent. Currently. Currently. Who knows? We might, we might be popping up there soon. Um, but, yeah, everywhere else across the globe is a global resource. So, so let's just kind of um, pull that apart a little bit. In, in terms of um, biodiversity compared to other marine habitats, how important is seagrass? It is incredibly important. Compared to bare sand now... Um, a single hectare of seagrass, you're looking at 28,000 invertebrates and around 8,000 fish in that single hectare. So it supports huge diversity. And that, that diversity is significant. I mean, I mean if, nothing, you know, if nothing else, this is why we should be protecting seagrass. It's that biodiversity value. No biodiversity, no life on the planet. That's, that's it. This is what we need to be focusing on. No biodiversity, no life. Nail on the head. In terms of carbon, ca capacity to trap carbon, compared to other forms of marine habitats, how important is seagrass? It's very important. Um, I am not going to put a figure on it right now because the estimates are very varied right now. Yeah. We know it's significant. And where you have got a dense, healthy, very old seagrass meadow like um, Posidonia in Shark Bay in Australia... That's like thousands of years old. That has got an extremely high carbon sequestration and storage value. Um, but where you've got new meadows, it's going to take quite a long time yeah. for a new or a sparse meadow to get up to scratch and hit, hit that. So it's hugely varied. There's a lot of research going on right now into the carbon value of different seagrass meadows in different locations across the globe. Another important thing is that we need to also be thinking about the overall gaseous exchange within a seagrass meadow because in an unhealthy environment with poor water quality, you could end up with net emission of greenhouse gases through the um, NOx emissions, methane. Right, well. so we've got to think about both it's sides. It's the whole picture. It needs to be a healthy environment. Okay, so another bit of context. You mentioned culture and coastal communities. How important is seagrass <laughs> compared to other marine habitats in terms of culture? Yeah. Again, I mean, I'm, I'm not... Seagrass is my thing. You, you kind of like it's, seagrass, it's don't my, you? It's my background. <laughs> I'm not dissing any other marine environment. And ultimately, what we need is a connected, healthy seascape with all of these environments, these different habitats. Healthy. But we're going to talk about seagrass. But seagrass, though, <laughs> is super cool. Um, and everywhere across its global range, from you know developing areas to very developed areas there is, you see this cultural connection mm. to this habitat. I've worked with Bajo communities in Indonesia where um, families have lost one of the parents and it provides this access to a resource 
for food, but then also these communities don't want to be far away from that meadow um, because they have grown up with that. That is their life. It's, it is that sense of belonging and it belongs to the seagrass meadow. Mm. And then in, in the UK, I've spoken to um, older generations who thankfully still remember a time when we had seagrass in certain areas right. um, and they're driven to help us do our work because they want their grandchildren to have that same connection. You know, they used to shrimp fish with their grandparents in a seagrass meadow. They're not catching huge amounts. That's a cultural connection. Yeah. Or they saw seahorses in a seagrass meadow and they want their grandchildren to see that same thing and experience that. And, and it's those things that are absolutely key that we need those memories. So I'm gonna, we're going to come on to the work that you are doing in a moment. Um, one more question before we get there. Uh, and I mentioned a UK stat at the beginning when we first got together. What has happened to our seagrass? <laughs> what has happened? Um, globally, we have lost huge amounts of our seagrass. Um, the estimates vary, but, you know, we're, we're talking about it's still in decline for significant soccer fields a minute kind of numbers. It's, like, it's psh, insane. I mean, it's, as we speak, um, it's... Yeah, yeah, it is being lost... Um, there was widespread loss across Europe, lost 50% of its seagrass in the 1930s. And it was largely attributed to a wasting disease within the seagrass, but it coincided with industrialization and poor water quality. And that has been a significant and remains one of the most significant impacts on seagrass meadows. So, but also, you know, coastal development, um, anchor scouring, uh, mooring scouring, those sorts of things, any kind of physical um, impact, mm -hmm. prop damage, um, the, all of those things will impact seagrass. The way, where we have got an opportunity now to put seagrass back is in those areas where the water quality has improved mm -hmm. somewhat, but there's still vast areas that might be suitable, but we're not going to try until the water quality is improved just a, a bit more to give seeds and seedlings a bit and, more of a chance to grow and you mentioned something very important there because if you don't fix the water quality then you can't fix the seagrass yes yeah. right so we've done the background we've done the context we've done how bad things have got what are you doing to fix it okay so we're, we're a grassroots organization um so what you did there we came <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, my seagrass seed was planted when um, oh. I was doing my PhD right. uh, in. research in Indonesia, actually. Okay. Um, and I, f I fell into seagrass really accidentally because I went, um, my research was looking at marine resource use patterns just broadly. Yeah. And I had the assumption that people would be dependent on um, coral reefs and mangroves that didn't really consider seagrass. Right. But actually, the highest dependence locally was on seagrass meadows for cultural fulfillment, um, access to resource, um, backup livelihood access to financing through collections. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I've worked on seagrass in different places around the world. And everywhere is the same case. There is this level of dependence, cultural connection to this incredible habitat. But at the same time, there are lots of people still that are 20 years ago, no one was really talking about seagrass. There are a few excellent researchers starting to, to pick up on it. Um, but then seagrass, Project Seagrass was born from uh, that recognition of a need to raise awareness, really, about this global resource that was being ignored. It was, seagrass has been referred to as the ugly duckling of the marine environment, right. because, it, you know, it's not got that same appeal as a... As a coral. To some it, people, yeah. it hasn't got the same appeal as a coral. But to coral you. Seagrass is beautiful. You just need to sit for a few minutes in a seagrass meadow, immersed and looked down. And you're going to see, in the UK, you're going to see pipefish, you're going to see baby place, you might see a seahorse, you know, you're going to see hermit crabs and green crabs. There is so much life, mm. but you've got to be a bit more patient. Mm. So um, most of your work is in the, in the UK, but you're, you're what, so tell, no, us, tell us about, tell us about your, you know, your, I, I want to go into that seagrass meadow where you are working. Tell, tell, take me there now. Describe what it looks like, but what the intervention is, what the work okay. you are doing with the local community to, you, to secure You could them. pick a coastline pretty much anywhere in the world and find a sheltered bay, and there will be some seagrass, hopefully. I mean, the decline's massive and it's patchy across its range, but you will be able to find it. Um, up where we're doing restoration work on the ground, that's UK-based for us. Yeah. So we've got big restoration projects on the south coast of England, 
um, south coast of Wales, north Wales coast on the Slane Peninsula, um, and in the Firth of Forth in Scotland. Mm-hmm. Um, my particular favourite spot is the Slane Peninsula in North Wales, right. and there we are working. We, we're monitoring an existing meadow that is absolutely outstanding. This is a UK meadow. The sun shines, you're down there, the water's clear, it's full of life. It's, we need people to understand that it's there, it's right there. Even on our doorstep, you can find a beautiful meadow. Um, but that meadow is also a donor meadow for us. So it's very healthy reproductively, and we um, harvest wild seed from that meadow to help us elsewhere restore. So we are planting across the Lean Peninsula um, in different sites at the moment. A lot of the work we're doing right now is trials with different methods. Um, so the, the science for seagrass restoration, for marine restoration, generally lags behind that of terrestrial restoration. But there's a lot for us to do. Um, so we're trialing different methods. Is, is, is marine, uh, I mean, how different is it to terrestrial uh, um, propagation? It's, it's much more complex. I mean, it's really, everything's harder when you're working in a saltwater environment, I think. Um, but we're looking at, it, for, for seagrass, if we get germination between 5 to 10%, we are super, super excited about that. Right. Um, and I believe if you get less than 80% in the terrestrial environment, it's a okay. bit disappointing. Okay. Um, but we're, so we're, it's hard. we're it working is, it's on harder. that. It's hard. It's hard. Um, and restoration's not the easy solution. You know, it's protection's the best thing we can do for... And we need that net gain. We need the protection and we need to bring back. Um, but we're doing that, and we're, we're working on the so, science so re- to improve so, so, so those re- methods. So restoration, um, restoration is typically uh, uh, protect, cultivate, and, and, and sow and spread. Yeah. In, in, yeah. And, and can you take uh, seedling, seedlings? Seeds, seedlings. Correct terminology? Small plants. Small seedlings. plants, small things. <laughs> can you take them from one place to another, or do you, I mean, what kind of variation... Yeah. Is there, what do you need to be careful about? You, you cannot. <laughs> um, and where we're working around the UK, there's very strict licensing um, procedures that we've got to go through. We have to have a marine license to plant. Right. And we can't just take seeds from Orkney and go and plant them in South Wales. Right. And there are different genetic variations of the same seagrass species. Yep. Um, so there, there are rules that need to be followed. And we need to be careful about biosecurity and you know, the transfer of, of different organisms. So, so, so if that is recovery in a sense, um, preservation is harder? Preservation is harder to get funding for. Right. Um, but I think... And why is that? I don't know. It's tangible, isn't it? A, a, you can put a price on a seed and put a certain number of seeds in right. a certain area of the seabed and then, you know, you've got something. It's not that simple because you, you're not planting a meadow. You're putting that seed in, giving it its best chance to, to grow into a, a, a seedling and then a plant and then, you know, spread laterally. Um, but then you need to also go back and reinforce annually this restoration is a long process right. doesn't it's just not you don't one, plant once one and you've done it no you do not you don't plant a hectare you have to keep going back yeah. um and this is where it's the then one of the nice things about seagrass and restoration one of the nice things and one of the most challenging things is that we have to rely on volunteers for this work because all of the seed collection that we do is by hand it's hugely intensive it's a huge number of yeah. out people this is hours not something are required you can automate. no no not yet people are working on it and there's some right. really cool Aaron is Aaron robots. here Aaron <laughs> might be able to fix it for you yeah <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that um, yeah so we are looking at trying to mechanize parts of the process but at the moment we are relying on volunteers to help collect seed and then also help sow that seed back um, so if that's the UK picture, what's the nature of the work you're trying to expand in the rest of the world? So elsewhere, I mean, we're, we, we're not going to be that kind of fly-in, fly-out type researcher. And Project Seagrass is founded on science. We, are, we all have a background of science. Mm-hmm. Um, but the way that we do work is that we will provide technical advice to communities, NGOs, small community groups on the ground who are close to a home meadow or who recognize that there's a problem. We've been working in this way across Southeast Asia um, recently in a a, a big project and just helping build capacity so that these local organizations can um, 
provide an evidence base. So it's going through the whole, how do we collect data? How do we collect robust data? And how do we analyze that data? And then how do we present that data as an argument to policymakers um, or natural resource managers to firstly show that there is a problem here right. um, or show that people are this reliant on this habitat? Right. And you've got, there's an app, isn't there? There's an app, yes. Of course there's an app. Uh, yeah. It's 2024. Yeah. yeah. Um, our app is called Seagrass Spotter. Yep. Um, and this app, it's, it's so cool. Um, so, and it's genuinely useful for people to use this app. Right. So um, you can use it anywhere across the globe. You download it. You take a georeference photograph of a patch of seagrass, um, upload that photograph. And, the, and the, the rationale behind this is you're trying to map. Yeah. So we need All, to map. We, we need, need to, to know map. more yeah, about where yeah. seagrass is. We need is. to know where it is and we need help. So it's very widespread, but because it's patchy across its range, it's difficult to map. Yep. And so when you're thinking about any kind of, like the, the, the juggernaut of credits, it's moving and we are moving that way. But we can't put values on um, things that we don't know and we don't know where it is. And so this is a tool that is helping plug that gap. We're working with lots of tech companies at the moment on um, trying to identify seagrass from space right. okay. uh, through satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. And so part of Spotter also is doing that ground truth thing. I think we're quite far away from being able to do that because yeah. it's really difficult to differentiate between all the different grease stuff in, yeah, yeah. in the sea. Anyone here who's good at that kind of stuff, please come and talk to Leanne. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, in the, in the, it might be easier in the Med where you've got clear waters. Um, in the UK where you've got turbid waters and you've got massive tidal ranges, yeah. it's still incredibly challenging. But we need to know where it is and we need to know where change is happening. And so Seagrass Spotter is a citizen science tool where anyone can be involved and contribute. Um, so um, we're, we're going to come to what, what your ask is to everybody here. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to ask uh, a little bit more understand a little bit more about the relationship between water quality and um, and your ability to generate or regenerate uh, uh, damaged seagrass. Yeah. It, 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 it explain what that connection is. So f for too long, water quality has been the elephant in the room, really. Um, it destroyed, poor water quality destroyed vast areas of seagrass in the first place. So it caused the damage. Um, yeah. And then, you know, we had wonderful things like the uh, Water Quality Framework Directive and um, there were huge improvements. And so now there are large areas where we could put back. Um, I mean, it's always easier to reinforce something that you've already got rather than start from scratch. Yeah. However, there are also now vast areas that seagrass has got no chance at, as it stands of growing, like this, the seeds won't germinate, the plants won't survive where water quality is poor. Yep. We've been working um, recently with uh, Blue Marine Foundation and Surface Against Sewage, mm -hmm. which is a really nice collaboration because it's addressing that water quality issue from different perspectives and yep. Yep. really pushing for, we, we need action on that. Yep. For so many reasons, you know, not just seagrass. Which, which, which I think leads us <laughs> back to, in a, in a sense, where um, uh, where we started with with um, with our Sea Shepherd keynote, what can what can people here do? Yeah, I think we're the softer side of, of what people can do, I think and I, I think <laughs> for us it's about bringing people on that journey. Yeah, um, and and we're still in a bubble. You know, people don't know what seagrass is. We're, there's still a way to go there to get people in. You, we need people to care. And then when people care, they will act, they'll do things. Um, and so that's the start point with us. We work with local communities, we work with fishers. We have the conversations about why this is important, why it's not there and why we should bring it back for everyone's benefit. Mm -hmm. So I think for anyone that's got an interest, just sharing that interest and bringing other people on the journey yeah. is an incredibly positive thing to do. Um, we've had a really, sorry, slightly, not off topic, really inspiring day today because this afternoon yeah. we had a takeover by a local I saw, school. I, on, saw, on I our, think I saw that on your stall. Insta. And it, what was that? just heartening. So this school had, they, they had challenges on different stalls around yeah. change now and one of yeah. them was on ours. Um, and so a couple of pupils from the school had been researching seagrass okay. and come up with a, a little game for other kids at the conference to come and play basically to learn about seagrass and why it's important. 
Um, and that is just, it's super inspiring for me to see that we've done something that has engaged the school, that has engaged their students who are then teaching other kids Amazing. about this important habitat and that's something that we can all do and I'd like that's there's my optimism and hope for the future is they now care and they are going to do something you know they're going to share that um, and you know as a collective we can we need it's going to take a lot of people to solve the seagrass problem and we need communities engaged on the ground to do that and you have I can't think of a better way to have closed this session uh, Leanne, thank you very much indeed for telling us, well, all about seagrass, but also, I think, driving this towards the solutions, which are the young people who are going to get us out of this dreadful mess that the rest of us have caused. So you. probably you've caused it less than I have, I think, because you're fixing it. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us on our panel about um, oceans and how we protect them. And I, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time at Change Now. It's been a pleasure. But I'm still on. No, they've turned me off. No, you can still hear me, can't you? <laughs> I was just going to say how brilliant you were, and your, your voice survived. Your voice survived. Has anybody got a, a strepsil or a, or a glass of chamomile tea or something? Red wine. Or red wine.